put all of the politicians end to end around the equator, it'd be a good idea just to leave them there. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. It's Sunday morning here in Yerevan and people are starting to show up for the services at this, the oldest church in this town. This, this church behind me was built in the 1600s and it was on top of a church that was here from the 13th century. So uh, this town being one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world and Armenia being the very first Christian nation that was declared a Christian nation in the year 301 AD. Uh, this is a very special place where people have been worshiping literally for 700 years or more. Uh, and so I'm going to go to the church service here this morning and join them and just soak it in. I don't know if I'll be able to film much in there, but I'll do the best I can. <laughs> conflict with Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, Azerbaijan, it, you, you'd be tempted to, to chalk it up to just a simple conflict between Christianity and Islam. And that certainly is part of it. But that's not the whole story. And there's actually a whole lot more to it than that. The capital, Yerevan, is a very modern city, but everything in it exudes the same sorts of qualities that, that make you feel that they're, they're beautiful and ancient and wise. And they have a certain sadness. And part of that has to do with the COVID crisis and the economic downturn and the war that's going on. But you get the feeling that it goes deeper than that. These people have suffered greatly. You can tell by looking in their eyes. Let's talk about the history of how Armenia got to be the way it is now. Uh, as you probably know, Armenia and Azerbaijan were both satellite countries in the Soviet bloc back until the Soviet Union broke up in the 1990s. And so when that happened, the resulting sort of mashup, part of the the problem here is that uh, the boundary lines of Georgia, Armenia, uh, basically all the countries in the Caucasus were drawn by Stalin without much regard for the people that lived there, where they lived, or who they wanted to be governed by, or what language they spoke, or anything like that. Uh, so Stalin just sort of arbitrarily drew these lines, and so you have these enclaves of uh, Armenians, for example, living in Azerbaijan and they don't want to be Azerbaijani, they don't want to be Azeri. Um, they, they speak uh, Armenian, they keep the Armenian culture, they are Christian uh, and not Muslim and so they, they wanted to be Armenian. So when the Soviet Union cracked up in 1991, uh, right, right around there, uh, the Armenian uh, people, uh, in addition to this country becoming independent, 
<clears throat> the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, or as they call it, the Republic of Artsakh, uh, which is 90 plus percent, uh, probably 96, 97 percent uh, Armenian in that area, they decided that they wanted to be part of Armenia, even though it's sort of surrounded by Azerbaijan. Now, to this day, the world pretty much sees Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Azerbaijan because it's kind of hard for us to uh, get it, our heads around the idea of uh, an, an exclave like that. So it'd be, for example, like um, Missouri saying that they've got, uh, uh, that it, there's a piece of Missouri inside Arkansas or Nevada saying, uh, well, you know, Sacramento, California really should be partner of, of Nevada. So even though it's, you know, two hours drive from the Nevada border, we're going to make an exclave there and call that part of Nevada. It's pretty, pretty confusing uh, to say the least, but that's what they did because the people in that area, again, wanted to be uh, independent from Azerbaijan. They didn't want to be ruled by the Muslim dictator there and they wanted to, to be Armenian. So they formed the Republic of Artsakh uh, and the Armenian military at that time was much stronger in relation to Azerbaijan's military than it is now. And so they took the whole area, not just Nagorno-Karabakh, but the whole area surrounding it as well and held it. And so Azerbaijan really didn't have much of a choice. They didn't have much of a choice of whether or not uh, to allow this excerpt to take place. Now, in the intervening 30 years, uh, there's been some changes that have happened. First of all, Azerbaijan, with its oil wealth, has built up a very large army. Now their army is about five times the size of the army of Armenia. And so now they see this as an opportunity to take back the Nagorno-Karabakh and to make it their own. Well, the problem being that, um, again, everybody that lives there is Armenian and wants to stay Armenian. And so they're not gonna go quietly if Azerbaijan wants to take them over. So as far as they're concerned, they're fighting for their own survival, uh, not just for territorial conquest or anything like that. The, you also have to think about the proxy elements here um, because who supports Azerbaijan? Well, um, the Turks. The Turks are supporting Azerbaijan because they're fellow Muslims. Uh, and Turkey also gets a large part of its energy from uh, Azerbaijan uh, from their oil fields and gas fields. Uh, so Turkey doesn't want to upset that apple cart either. So Turkey is supporting Azerbaijan, but Russia uh, and Armenia have always maintained close ties even after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And Russia even has gone so far as to have a mutual aid pact with Armenia. They have a military base here in Armenia. And so, uh, uh, for Azerbaijan to attack Armenia, they have to pretty much attack Russia as well, and they're not willing to do that. Russia doesn't have bad relations with Armenia. They, is, uh, they actually sell uh, armaments to both countries. Uh, so Russia kind of has a financial interest or an economic interest in seeing this conflict continue. So this is one of those things where the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians love to hate each other. They've been hating each other for centuries, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. Part of that problem is that they have sort of mutually exclusive cultures. Uh, Armenia being heavily Christian, Azerbaijan almost the same percentage Muslim, um, and they don't play well together. Some fish just don't play well in the same tank, and that's not going to change either. So why don't you know more about this? Why haven't you heard more about this ongoing conflict? I mean, really, this, this fight has been going on for more than 30 years. They've just had a ceasefire uh, since the 90s that has flared up from time to time. Uh, and now this is the worst flare-up they've seen uh, in 30 years. But 
Uh, why haven't you heard more about it in the United States? The answer to that question is just simply because America doesn't really have a dog in this fight. Uh, America, it, it doesn't uh, affect America's national interests any if the people of Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia kill each other. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. They're killing each other with impunity right now. But should we be concerned? Well, I'd submit to you that yes, we should. We should be concerned about this conflict. Not only because uh, morally and ethically, we should stand against evil any place that it rears its ugly head. We should uh, call evil what it is. And when people are killing each other, that's just evil. Um, so we ought to have something to say about that. <clears throat> we should also stand up for persecuted minorities and, and uh, 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 the, the people in this country, in Armenia, uh, these Christians are being murdered in droves by uh, much larger force and we ought to have something to say about that. Uh, in the, the, the greater analysis though, this is uh, another place where we see, just like in Syria, Turkey is expanding its influence. And if we don't stand up and say something to Turkey about it, if we don't push back some, I'm not saying we have to send troops over here. I'm not saying we need to even send armaments over here. I'm not real big on the idea of sending armaments anywhere that we're not willing to send our sons and daughters uh, because those armaments, armaments are durable and fungible and will eventually uh, come back to bite us. They'll be shooting back at us at some point. But we should care and we should stand up and we should maybe impose sanctions on Turkey for assisting Azerbaijan in this uh, to, to kill innocent, lots of innocent civilians. They're not targeting military bases. They're not targeting just military concentrations. They're also just carpet bombing uh, civilian areas in Stepanakert. And I'm headed that way shortly, so we'll talk more about that soon. But suffice it to say that this conflict is uh, an outgrowth of power politics between Russia, Iran, China, um, the United States, and Turkey. And what, it, what I mean is, why hasn't the United States taken more of a stand against Turkey? Well, because we kind of have to treat Turkey with kids, kid gloves because we have that military base in Turkey called Incirlik. And if, it was, if that was all we had, just a military base, then we could just close it down and open a military base somewhere else. But Incirlik is special because they've got a bunch of our nuclear weapons there that have been there for decades. These are older nuclear weapons. They're not suitcase nukes. They're not small. They're the size of a Suburban. So you don't just, you know, what, the question is, how do we get those things out of there? If we go in and try to take those out, there's a good chance Turkey would seize them. There's a good chance Turkey would, would try to stop us somehow. And so it's a real sensitive situation there probably the best thing we could do would be to try to dismantle those things piece by piece and just take out the plutonium or whatever um, and, and leave the rest there. But even that is very tricky. And, uh, you know, taking fissile material uh, out across Turkish borders and, and uh, that sort of thing um, is, is not as easy as it sounds. So, uh, we are, in a way, sort of beholden to Turkey, or at least stuck with Turkey uh, for the time being. And so we have to try to uh, encourage them to do the right thing and not murder all their neighbors. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we can't afford to make them too angry. And that is a, a real issue for America to deal with. <clears throat>